I'm Pete Warden. I'm the tech lead on the mobile and embedded side of TensorFlow, which is Google's open source software for doing machine learning and deep learning. And what I'm here to talk about is why machine learning is heading towards the future of running on tiny devices. And I think, as the previous talk was saying, on the edge, though I always find that a little bit of a very cloud-centric view, <laughs> that cloud is always in the center, and everything else has to be on the edge. So I just tend to think about it as computing that's happening where people are. And we already have hundreds of billions of tiny computers in the world around us. We just don't notice them, because most of them are doing things that used to be done by electromechanical systems, things like windshield wipers, or washing machine controllers, or um, things that are just sort of living in your TV remote control. And for manufacturers, mostly, these are just cheaper and easier replacements where you can put software instead of having to wire up analog circuits. But these are actually fully capable CPUs. And there's hundreds of billions of them out there. And they're super cheap, and they're super low power already. The average price is below 50 cents. So this is not some crazy dream of the future. We're already surrounded by this computing infrastructure. What the big problem for everybody who's trying to do interesting things on these computing devices is the power that they actually use. The CPUs are so cheap that they're practically free, but if you want to have something that runs for any period of time and you have it wired up to the mains, that means you either have to plug it in, uh, which if something's hard to reach or you have to wire it in is a real problem, or you have to um, sort of install it on a factory floor, or you have to have something like a phone that you periodically um, plug in um, you know, every day or every few days for a laptop. And that massively limits what you can actually build using these kinds of devices. There's not much you can do. And the only thing that's holding you back from doing a lot more is trying to keep the energy usage down as low as possible. And just in this example, um, you can see these uh, like displays um, are using like 0.4 of a watt. Um, Cell radios, when they're running, use almost a whole watt. Um, and you run down to all of these common things that you might think about having in a connected device. And they're all using a lot of power. And if you think about using a milliwatt, which is what a fairly you know, parsimonious microcontroller at the moment might use, a coin battery would only last for about a month using just one milliwatt. So you can see anything that's using hundreds of milliwatts will drain the battery in almost no time. So you really have this hard design limitation. And what's interesting about the figures that we looked at there is that the CPU, the compute itself, is using almost none of the power budget. Anything that requires radio Anything that's actually sending data anywhere else ends up using a bunch of power. But things like sensors and things that are doing compute um, can actually use under a milliwatt. And in some cases, for things like image sensors, they can actually even harvest energy and power themselves off the light that's coming in. And this isn't just kind of an aberration. This is something that seems almost like a law, like Moore's law, that the amount of distance that you have to move data means that you have to pay a lot more of a cost in terms of the energy for moving that. So compute, which happens inside the die itself, tends to be very, very power efficient. Sending something even a few meters tends to use a lot more power. And we have sensors that are constantly pulling in data from the environment. And we ignore 
most of the data that's coming in because the bottlenecks are almost always in sending the data somewhere. It's too expensive to send the data somewhere. I first ran across this, it first became really clear to me when I was working with companies that are doing cheap satellites and sending them up into orbit and they're essentially using cell phone components. And it turns out you can have image sensors that can take HD video and extremely high resolution, but they've got no way of transmitting those down to the surface because the bandwidth just isn't high enough. And it turns out that this is a pattern that recurs across all kinds of devices, um, from accelerometers on devices and industrial uses where they basically only use the detect if there's some kind of crash. Um, and things like pedometers, which are only spotting steps, they're not telling what kind of activities you're doing. So all of these together, the fact that we have all of these devices out there, that compute is super energy efficient, and that there's this backlog of data that we're not using, um, if we could fill that gap, if we can do something that runs on cheap microcontrollers, if we can do something that uses very little energy, that relies on compute, not radio, and that does something interesting with our sensor data, that starts to open up some really interesting possibilities. So deep learning is a fantastic application for embedded space because it uses loads of compute. It's compute bound. It doesn't need much in terms of uh, memory storage or memory access. It can just work very well with just tens of kilobytes, but it needs a lot of compute, which is a thing that is really energy efficient. And we have examples of this with both Apple and Google already running things like their voice recognition on memory controllers within the phone because they can do this always on without draining the battery. It's just that these are seen as specialized applications. This isn't widely known within the broader uh, embedded or machine learning community. And for a practical example, we think about something um, like image recognition. Uh, that might seem like it's a very, very hard task if you think about you know, all of the training that happens on GPUs. But actually, we can do a single arithmetic op for just five picojoules. And then if you look at something like MobileNet, which is doing image classification, and figure out how many arithmetic ops that takes, um, it's only 22 million, which is quite a lot. But it turns out if you take the amount of power that's required for one op, um, it's only around 110 microjoules um, that you need for a very basic but very effective image recognition application. And running at one frame per second, that will give you a coin battery that runs for almost a year. So what I'm looking at is a voice interface that 50 cents that runs on a coin battery, all sorts of other applications. We don't really know what people are going to build with this stuff, but we know it's happening. And really what I want you to leave with is the excitement that I feel about the applications that are coming and all of the amazing things that we're going to be able to do with machine learning on these tiny, cheap chips. So I'm Pete Warden on Twitter. I've written a blog post about this. And I hope to chat to some of you afterwards.